Good evening. I am Thad Reynolds, and I am President and Tonal Director of Reynolds Associates Organ Builders. You all know what a president is, but if you are not acquainted with the pipe organ industry, you probably don't have any idea what a tonal director does. Among other things, keeping the books, sweeping the shop, and sometimes cleaning the litter boxes for our two shop kitties. It is my job to decide how our organs will eventually sound, and to adjust the sound of each pipe in the organ accordingly. Each individual pipe in an organ must be carefully adjusted to all the other pipes and to its environment. A few months ago, I was standing here in our voicing studio, and I was busy cutting up your pipes. Um, maybe I'm getting ahead of my story, so let's go back. What is this marvelous musical machine that Mozart called the King of Instruments? To many folks, the organ is the console. That's because the console, with its keyboard, stops, and controls, is the most and sometimes the only visible part of an organ. This idea is encouraged by electronic organs in which there's nothing else but a console and a few speakers. In an authentic organ, the console is merely a control center, what in a computer would be called a user interface. The console produces no sound itself. It simply allows the organist to control the hundreds, thousands, or even tens of thousands of pipes that make the music. In this organ, the massive oak console has three ivory and ebony keyboards and a 32-note pedal board with maple and ebony keys. There are also draw knobs and touches to operate the many voices and functions of the instruments. Groups of these can be turned on and off with a complex memory system that we will discuss later and that you will see Martin Ellis use this evening. But the music is actually made by 1,365 handcrafted organ pipes. Some of these are made of wood, some of metal. In this organ, the smallest pipe is about half an inch long the largest over 16 feet. Each pipe is blown like a whistle by compressed air from a blower in the basement. This air enters the pipes from the wind chests, which contain a system of valves. Whether large or small, loud or soft, each pipe is a separate individual. This choir of individual sounds is what gives a pipe organ its unique and wonderful sound. Each pipe in the organ is a specialist. The middle C pipe in the swell viola, for instance, is about two feet long. It plays only middle C and produces only the viola tone. So for every pipe on the keyboard, there must be one individual pipe for each note in each voice. That means in the case of the viola, there are 61 pipes. The biggest pipe in this set is eight feet long. The smallest, less than three inches. In the Trinity organ, there are 21 sets of pipes, called ranks. For reasons of space, there are also a few additional sounds that are digitally produced. These voices are grouped into divisions, each with its own keyboard and each with its own musical purpose. This isn't a synthesizer loaded with interesting but unrelated sounds. Much like a great building, the tones of a pipe organ are architectural, needing foundation sounds, a structural framework, a roof or crown of upper pitches, and some interesting and colorful tonal decoration. In the Trinity organ, there are three keyboard divisions located in the organ case. These are the swell, controlled from the topmost keyboard, the choir, controlled from the bottom keyboard, and the grate, the powerhouse division, which plays from the center. The pedals control some of the largest pipes in the organ, which are in various locations in the organ case. The organist can also couple these divisions together, so they are all played simultaneously from one keyboard or the pedals. Trinity's pipe organ started life in 1958 at the M.P. Moeller Organ Company in Hagerstown, Maryland. Moeller was the largest organ builder in the world. In fact, Moeller was the largest organ builder ever. In over a century, they built nearly 12,000 pipe organs, ranging from tiny instruments to some of the largest organs in the world. 
As with most organ builders, the majority of Moeller's work was for churches, although they also built many organs for theaters, concert halls, and even private homes. No musical instrument is as diverse and individual as a pipe organ. Literally each organ, in fact each pipe, has its own personal sound. Over centuries of development, pipe organs have adapted to a whole gamut of musical styles, tastes, and literature. As builders and conservators of these wonderful and valuable instruments, part of our job is to match the character of each organ we build or renovate to the unique worship needs of the congregation it will serve. That's the creative and fun side of our business. But before we can be great artists, we must first be really good mechanics, plumbers, computer specialists, metal fabricators, and electricians. A pipe organ is a splendidly complex creation, and with proper care and some rebuilding every half century or so, it can last virtually forever. In fact, it would be difficult to think of a product of human ingenuity that is more green than a pipe organ. The sound of pipes made from trees felled or ores mined decades or even centuries ago can continue to inspire generations yet unborn. The vast bulk of an organ can be rebuilt, recycled repeatedly, preserving both resources and investment. Molar pipe organs were very well made mechanically and thousands of them remain giving dependable service. This particular organ here at Trinity was in need of a thorough overhaul and now that this has been done it is good for many more decades of music making. Our first task was to create a report for the church outlining what needed to be done. We had to explain why the organ needed renovation when to most people in the pews it sounded like it always had. You see as pipe organs age the response starts to become sluggish, and individual stops or notes stop functioning properly. Since the pipes themselves don't really age, though, what does work produces the same sound it always had. So we met with your organist and the trustees and put together a plan that would not only rebuild the molar organ, but would also apply modern technologies to it. Technologies that were undreamed of in 1958. Many organists will play a pipe organ during its lifetime, and it will be heard in many different kinds of settings. Our goal is to improve the organ for all these situations, so we use that perspective rather than designing to one person's particular taste or wish list. So shortly after Christmas, we arrived at the church one morning and began dismantling the organ. We removed the pipes and disassembled the wind chests, which are under the pipes. The chests contain thousands of tiny leather membranes and valves. After nearly 60 years of use, it was time to replace these perishable parts in a process that is called re-leathering. Some salespeople actually try to frighten church committees into destroying wonderful instruments and replacing them with fakes by relating how difficult and costly it is to re-leather an organ. It does take some skill and patience, but if the job is done right, the result is literally as good as new and can be done for a fraction of the cost of a new pipe organ. The process of rebuilding the mechanical heart of the organ was accompanied by a major brain surgery on it as well. When this organ was built, all the logic that told each pipe when to play and that could recall voice combinations for the organist was done mechanically with wood, wire, and again, leather. There were thousands of contacts and moving parts, all of which were tired. Literally, the brain of this organ was burned out. Working with our supplier for this specialized equipment, we custom designed a new system that manages these functions with the speed and dependability of a computer system. The controls may look similar, but their technology is light years ahead of the original can even record music in its memory and play it back. We removed all the components from the console, including the bulky mechanical switching system. We completely rebuilt the ivory-covered keyboards and the pedal board, 
and constructed a new interior of solid walnut for the console and populated it with all new controls. The new wiring is organized, neat, and meets the most current codes. Finally, after months of careful restoration work, this organ was ready to breathe once again. Waking up an organ for the first time is a lot like waking up a patient after surgery. The big day was in early August. Everything was reassembled and the organ was mostly wind tight. But with its first breath of air, all the valves in the instrument needed to seat properly. The patient had to take its first difficult steps. By the time the first session with the wind was over, the organ was so exhausted it actually sighed as its first wind drained away. With care though, the instrument healed and recovered quickly and before long it was functioning better than it ever had, literally running laps around itself. Once everything was back together, we were able to complete the revoicing of this instrument. Which brings me back to cutting up your pipes. <coughs> cutting up is actually a part of the voicing process and is not really vandalism. We cut the mouths of the pipes slightly higher in some stops to give their sound more depth and strength. There are also several other adjustments we made to control how loud each pipe is and the specific character of its sound. This is a painstaking process that was performed in our voicing studio and then refined and perfected when the pipes were installed in the church. This congregation has had three pipe organs over the last 124 years. Pipe displays have been a functional part of two of these instruments. In fact, the original Johnson organ in the former building, which was built in 1889, had nearly 60 exposed pipes, stenciled and decorated in the most vivid Victorian colors. Organ pipes are once again visible in the Trinity instrument. There are several reasons we did this. Moving these large pipes from the interior of the organ allowed space for the new trumpet voice. The red curtain that was behind the altar, although beautiful, dampened the sound of the organ pipes behind it and distorted the tone of the instrument. Visually, these pipes represent something else, us. They are different sizes, different shapes, and made of different materials. They have bodies, mouths, lips, feet, and even toes. No two are exactly the same, yet all stand behind the eternal symbol of the cross, all blending their individual voices in praise to God. The analogy goes further. Like us, the organ pipes need occasional adjustment to keep them singing together in perfect harmony. Some of their voices are not even particularly attractive as individuals, except when combined with the others. Since they are individual and all different, none is truly perfect. But oddly, it is those tiny individual differences, differences that can't be produced any other way, that make a pipe organ special. Again, very much like us. So there you have it. After years of planning and nine months of effort, we are proud to return your great Moeller Reynolds pipe organ to you in hopes that it will be a rich and varied voice for the gospel and that it will speak love and greetings from you to your descendants at Trinity. I hope you find joy and inspiration in tonight's inaugural concert and that this event will be the first of many opportunities for this great organ to add its magnificent voice to the proclamation of God's word.